We are back again with another DIY on the E90. This time we're going to be addressing some oil leaks. We're going to be replacing the oil pan gasket on this 2007 BMW 328i. Now this process is going to be very similar for most of the E90, E91, E92, E93, except for the M3. So all of the parts that we're using are from ECS Tuning. Now ECS Tuning has been a longtime supporter of this channel. So if you guys need anything, make sure you check them out. All the links will be down below. Along with this oil pan gasket, we're also gonna be replacing the engine mounts. So all that stuff is probably a good time to do all of it at once since you already have the whole front subframe removed. Now I'll have chapters throughout the whole video, but most of this stuff is gonna have to be done in steps. A couple of things, we are gonna be removing the entire subframe. You don't really have to, you can let it drop down, but we're gonna be replacing a lot of the suspension stuff later on. So we're just gonna be pulling off the entire subframe. Now as we're going through here, there's a couple of things that are already removed on the car. I've removed the wheels, I've removed the air box, the air intake scoop, and even the whole cabin filter assembly is already removed. Now I've got all of this addressed in other videos, I'll have those linked down below. So if you need those steps, check those videos out. So we're just gonna get right to it. We're at the part where we're gonna be removing the engine cover, and then we're gonna be installing the tow hook onto the engine so we can put an engine support bar. Before we get started, it's always a good idea to disconnect the battery when we're gonna be doing something extensive like this. So go ahead and get that disconnected. Once all that's disconnected and you've got the air box and all that removed, let's remove the cover. It's gonna be held in with four five millimeter hex screws. There's two in the front and two in the back. So we're, we're missing the two in the back, but there's one right here and one down in the corner. Another thing we're gonna to wanna to remove are the three T30 mounting bolts for that hard coolant line. Now I had this addressed in our last video on the cooling system. I'll have that section posted in here as well. Are the two T30 mounting screws that mount this hard plastic line to the subframe. We're gonna go ahead and pull out this screw. It's a T30. So once those three T30 screws are out, they're attached to the subframe. And since we're gonna be removing the subframe, we don't wanna tug on that coolant line. Since we're also replacing the engine mounts, it's a lot easier to access the two 16 millimeter nuts that hold the engine mounts to the actual engine. So we're gonna remove those two nuts from up here with a bunch of extensions. Start with the passenger one. Driver side next is gonna be a lot harder to see this one. You kind of have to fish it through a couple of connectors and lines and the steering column as well. Since we're gonna be removing the subframe, we're gonna to have to support the engine. We don't want the engine just falling out when the subframe comes out. So we're gonna use this tow hook that's found in the trunk. So this tow hook is what you would use if you need to get towed. And it actually threads into a section on the engine itself. Right next to the oil filter housing, we have this threaded section. Since we're doing the oil pan gasket, we're gonna to have to change the oil and oil filter as well. So, we're gonna go to remove the oil filter to break that seal so whatever oil is in this housing will slowly make its way down into the oil pan. Oh my God. That was on there way too tight. It's about due for an oil change anyways. Perfect timing. So this is sealed by this O-ring right here. So as long as we thread it in a couple of notches so no dirt and debris gets in, we can leave it just like that. Time to get our engine support bar in place. Now this one you can find at Harbor Freight. I think it's like a hundred bucks. It usually goes on sale too. So it just makes sense to have one. If you're doing this without a lift, you could also use a cherry picker if you have that, if you don't have this. But this is just gonna be safer because a cherry picker has the hydraulic jack, which could also leak and fail. We just wanna make sure that this engine doesn't fall out when we pull the subframe down. Now this is probably not gonna go anywhere, but to be safe, I wrapped this toe strap around it hundreds of times. <laughs> 
Now it's time to start working underneath the car. So here's one issue, the oil pan leaking. Here's another issue, the heater core leaking, which we still need to address. But first, let's knock out this oil leak. I usually like to show the whole process, but we're already missing all of these covers. And if you're doing this, I'm pretty sure you're gonna be able to take off those covers, if you still have them. Most of them are probably not even gonna be there. Now, well, let's get to it. It's about to get greasy, to say the least. Mm. Gotta love the E90. Let's start by draining the oil. You have the oil drain bolt. It is a 17 millimeter bolt. Let's see if I can do this without getting my hands dirty. Yes, sir. It smells like 7,000 miles. While the oil is draining, we can remove this triangular brace. It's gonna be held in with six 16 millimeter bolts. So we've got one here, one here, two right here, one in this hole and one right here. One over here, and one more right here. So I loosen them with the breaker bolt because we still don't have those Milwaukee's. Mm. Or the new rigid, you know, the half inch brushless, the extra, extra powerful one. We ain't got that one either yet. One day. So for more access when we're removing the oil pan, we're also gonna remove this metal tray cover. Now this is just held in with three 10 millimeter nuts. One right here, one inside, and one further up. Watcha. To disconnect the oil level sender, you just have to push the two tabs in on each side of the connector and you pull it off. Sometimes you need a little persuasion. Just very gently. Just filled up with some crud and oil. Let's continue disconnecting the connectors. This one is for the headlight level sensor. We're already missing one section of it, it's broken off. But you're just gonna push the two tabs in on each side. You're gonna push the two tabs in, and you should be able to pull it off. That pretty much sums up the connectors. We're also gonna be removing the control arms from the subframe. That's much easier than trying to remove the ball joints from the spindle or wheel hub end. So we're just gonna take out the two bolts that, is, that are holding the control arms in place on each side. On the driver's side, you're also gonna have this bar for the headlight level sensor. Now, usually the way I would do it, I would take off this 10 millimeter nut and you hold the other end with the wrench. But for us, we have this section right here. It's all zip tied and broken. So we're just gonna cut the zip tie and we're off. So now we're actually gonna remove the entire subframe. You don't necessarily have to do this like I said before. You could just let the subframe hang and the suspension arms and everything will hold it up. You just remove it from the actual chassis, the bolts. And the subframe just comes down and it'll just hang there and you'll have enough access to remove the entire oil pan. But this way it just makes it much easier and if you really want to clean the subframe and all that, you could do that as well. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take off these control arms, all four of them, just the two bolts that hold it to the subframe. And we're also going to remove the entire sway bar and we're going to remove the power steering rack from the subframe itself. And if we can let the power steering rack hang there. We're just going to disconnect the lines a little bit so there's no pressure on those. So the only thing that's going to be in our way when we're removing the oil pan is going to be the steering rack. And the only other thing is, so we removed the engine mount nuts from the top. Um, we're also gonna be removing the bolts from the bottom. Now, if you weren't replacing your engine mounts, you can just remove the bolts from the bottom and let the engine mounts stay attached to the engine while the subframe droops down. But if you're doing all this work, change the engine mounts. Trust me, it's gonna make a world of a difference. And while you're doing the engine mounts, you should do the transmission mounts as well. I have a whole DIY just on this. I'll, show, I'll have that link down below. So if you need to see it, you can. But yeah, let's get right to it. Let's remove the bolts for the, for the control arms, remove the bolts for the engine mounts, and remove the entire sway bar. Let's start with this control arm. You're gonna need to use an 18 millimeter wrench and an 18 millimeter socket or two 18 millimeter wrenches. And you're just gonna hold one side and loosen the other. <laughs> 
Next up, we have this control arm. Now this one, you just have to loosen the 18 millimeter bolt. And some of these sizes might be different depending on the year of your car. So just check it before you go at it. Well, someone's been in here recently or oil penetrated it and it's got all kinds of gooey mess on it. Next up, we have the sway bar link. Now this is gonna be different based on if your links have been replaced before or not, but you're gonna hold one end and you're gonna take off the nut off the other. So for us, we have a 17 millimeter nut with a 16 millimeter standoff kind of situation on the other side. Other options you may also have are the inside of the actual ball joint that the nut is attached to. You might have a Torx or a hex socket that could fit in there. Now we're gonna do the same thing on the driver's side and only thing that's gonna be different is the actual headlight level sensor. So that's gonna dangle. The sway bar is held in with four 13 millimeter nuts now, two on each side. We're gonna disconnect the brackets that hold the high pressure power steering line. It's held in with one 10 millimeter bolt on each side. So the reason we took off this high pressure steering line is we're just gonna let it dangle. Uh, that way when we release the power steering rack from the subframe, there's play in it and it doesn't get stressed, it doesn't pull on anything. So to remove the steering rack, it's just held in with two external Torx 12 bolts and there's a nut on each side of that bolt. So you are gonna have to counter hold the nut with a wrench while you take off that E12. Let's remove the two external Torx 12 bolts that attach each engine mount to the subframe itself. Now these are one-time use bolts, so you are gonna have to replace those. Now those engine mounts are gonna be loose if you remove the nuts from the top as well. You should be able to wiggle them around with your hand. The passenger side is the one that's usually gonna have a little bit more tension than the driver's side, just because the engine actually kind of tilts that way. So we are at the point where we can actually remove the entire subframe. And depending on the year and model of your E90 or E92, the bolts are gonna be a little bit different. For us, on this 2007 328i, we have 19 millimeter bolts. There's six of them, three on each side. What you also wanna do is you wanna support the subframe whether it's with a floor jack or a pull jack like this, you just want to support it. That way, once we have all the bolts out, there's still something on there. Now, I repeat, do not do this if your engine is not properly supported and if your engine mounts have a lot of tension on them still, do not do this until you go back to the top and you tighten up that engine support bar some more. That way it lifts it up because we definitely don't want to risk having any of the weight on the subframe still. We want it all on that engine support bar and the transmission mounts in the back. Now, once again, I've already loosened all the subframe bolts because we don't have that Milwaukee. Someone's been here recently. I'm so glad that someone's actually been here because they actually put some grease on it. Not anti-seize, they actually use real grease, which Helps us out, it's coming out pretty good. But I'm gonna clean all that up before I reinstall it and put anti-seize instead.
Also explains why some of the bolts are actually a little bit loose. Now each one of these is a different size. It's pretty self-explanatory which one goes where, but when we're reassembling, I'll show you while we're putting them on. Now the only thing that's left holding the subframe up from coming down will be the power steering rack itself. So the rack is just slid into the little grooves. We've already got all the bolts out, so we should be able to slide it up and out. Now as you can see, I got a little bit ahead of myself. I should have removed those tie rods because we're replacing them anyways, which was the reason why I wanted to pull the whole subframe down. But like I said, you, couldn't, you can do all this stuff without removing the subframe from the entire car. I am going to go ahead and have these instructions of removing the tie rods before you guys see this anyways. Now you just counter hold the ball joint with whatever size socket you need for your application. So now we've got the whole subframe out of the way and it is messy. With the subframe out of the way, we can finally pull down the oil pan. Now the oil pan is attached to the transmission with a couple of screws and there's also the transmission cooler lines that are on this automatic. Now if you have a manual, you're not going to have those cooler lines so you're probably not going to see this step. Some of the E9X chassis did have an oil return line that goes into the oil pan that's going to be held on with four tabs. And it's just a hose that comes down and attaches to the oil pan. I'll show you guys on our oil pan where the block off is. Now, if you have that, it's going to be a little bit different than what ours looks like. So there's going to be a couple of differences here, but overall, the gist of it is the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to first start off by taking off those transmission cooler line brackets. Here's one of the brackets. It's just held there with a 10 millimeter nut. And here is our oil block off that I was talking about for that return line. Now you don't need to remove this all the way, you just gotta loosen it so we can slide down the whole bracket. Now this bracket is further towards the cooler itself, toward the front of the engine. Now you don't need to remove the nut all the way, you just gotta loosen it and now you can see this whole thing is moving. With both brackets loosened, we can actually slide down the cooler lines and pull out that bolt and the whole bracket will lift up. Do the same thing for the front one. You can see the front one already popped out as well. Now we are going to have to mess with these lines a little bit to get access to some of the bolts. And also when we're pulling the oil pan down, we might have to move the lines a little bit. So what you can actually do is you can get a zip tie and zip tie it to the engine mount arm. That way it's out of the way. So we've got a zip tied out of the way. We can still move it around for some of the bolts, but now let's take off the bolts that are going from the transmission into the oil pan. Now there's three E10 bolts that go through the transmission. One right here, one up in this corner that are attached to this bracket, and one all the way up here. You can just let the bracket dangle once you have the two bolts removed. So now all around the whole oil pen, you're gonna have external Torx 12 bolts all around. Now these are aluminum bolts, so just be careful. You don't wanna strip them. Um, some of them might even come out broken, but like I said, nothing to worry about there. So we're just gonna take all of those off. The way I like to do it, I like to leave the ones that are easy to access, one on each corner, and just leave those loose, but leave them attached a little bit. That way the oil pan just doesn't fall out when all the bolts are out. Just wait till it starts dripping. Look at that one, that one's broken. That one just came out broken, so it was just holding on with hopes and dreams. Another one broken. That's two. Another one. Turn into DJ Khaled over here. Another one. People are gonna start thinking that I'm tightening them. That's why they're breaking, but no. I'm just trying to loosen it. See, that one's good. Another one. So far we've had more broken than actually came off. Another one. So here's what I'm thinking. Somebody 
somebody changed this oil pan gasket before, and that's why that subframe and everything is loose and lubed up. And they just tightened them too much and they all broke. And that's why some of the bolts have been replaced. Another one. Now the ones that are in the back are gonna be a little bit longer, but I'll show you guys all this when we're reassembling. No wonder why all the other bolts are broken. Whoever we'll put these on, put them on so tight. Mm. So here is how the gasket came out. That's why it's leaking. Well, that was the easy part, I guess. Wow, this is gonna be a fun job. Yeah, it's on there. And a lot of these are actually flush. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we gotta take out ten of them. Let's just hope a couple of them are just hand threaded. Or we can just take it off with our fingers, but let's try this one. Nope. Haha. <laughs> No. no, you gotta be shitting me. I drilled out all the other broken bolts. We left the final one so I can show you guys the easiest way to do it. You're gonna need something like this. I'll have it linked on Amazon. It's like a punch, but it's a spring-loaded punch. So what you do is you just push it in the middle and then it puts a little dot for you where you can start drilling. Now that's definitely not in the center, but this whole thing is all jagged. So it's gonna be really hard to get it in the center. And we just need a small enough hole to get a, like an extractor bit in there and then we can thread it out. Now here's the life hack. This is not just any drill bit, it's a cobalt drill bit. Now that makes it very, very strong and makes it easier to drill through pretty much any kind of metal. Now you really want one of these, it makes this job a lot easier compared to like a normal drill bit that's like titanium or whatever it is. Those normal drill bits, they just don't get it done. I'll have this link down below as well. This one is actually in a pack that came from Harbor Freight. Now I've had it for like a couple of months and it still works. Now I just have it on this extension just to make it easier for me to drill all the other ones that I was drilling before. Now I've got this broken easy out. The tip is broken off. Now I've got it hammered into this socket. That way it makes it easier for me to actually extract it. And the way these work is you put this into the hole that you just drilled. And as you're loosening it, it's actually reverse threaded so, sort of. So it actually digs into that broken bolt a lot more. So what you want to do is you want to get it into the hole that you drilled, hammer it in, and then you turn it counterclockwise. And now all we need to do is just clean everything up. Now you do want to be careful if you have a broken bolt somewhere further along in the engine somewhere else, you wanna make sure none of those shavings go inside the engine. So for us, this, this one was down here, so it'll just fall straight to the ground. I'm still gonna clean up the whole surface area. So here's most of the ones that I had to drill out. This one, I, do, I was able to actually grip it with some vice grips and it popped off. And the rest of these had to drill each and every single one. All right, so we've got the oil pan, the oil pan. We've got the oil pan mostly cleaned up. I did my best, you know, I'm not gonna scrub it. You don't really wanna put any kind of grooves or anything on here. There are quite a few already on here. I'm not sure where they came from. Probably from that previous job, whoever did that. Um, but I cleaned it up with a plastic scraper, whatever, like, you know, the chunks that were on there. Now on the engine side, there's quite a bit of pitting and there's all kinds of imperfections in the metal itself. Now the metal I believe is a magnesium alloy on the block and now we have this aluminum pan going on there which is why we have those aluminum bolts. So what I'm going to do, since this engine's probably not going to last another oil pan gasket change and we don't want it to, right? We want it, this oil pan gasket to not leak for a long, long time. Now the gasket that is the replacement gasket, even the stock ones, they're metal with this rubber lining right in the middle section. Now this rubber lining is on both sides of the gasket and it goes on the intersection and that's what usually like, you know, hardens up over time and then that's what starts leaking. So what we're going to do 
which I don't usually recommend this, but this is my cousin's car. He's gonna drive it till it dies. We're actually gonna put our TV on both sides of the gasket. Now we want a very, very thin layer and that's just gonna fill in any of those minor imperfections. Now I would use Curl T2, um, but it's just, we're gonna use the Permatex Ultra Black. There's a lot of it in one tube and we'll be able to coat both sides and we don't have to worry about anything. So we're gonna put a very thin layer down on the oil pan first. Then we're gonna put the gasket on top and put a very thin layer on top of the gasket as well. So it's coated on both sides of that rubber section. Now you wanna be very careful. You don't wanna get it into any of the holes. We don't need it anywhere in those. We don't want it in any crevices. We don't want it to drip into the pan either. So a very, very thin layer. Now, as you can see, I am not a professional RTV or I rarely ever use RTV. It looks super messy, but it's a very, very thin layer and I made sure it's not gonna get into the oil pan because we definitely don't want any of the RTV roll it around in the oil. It takes 24 hours to fully cure. So the way we're gonna do it is you put it up and then you snug up all the bolts and then you wait one hour before you do the full torque. Now the torque on these aluminum bolts is very, very minor, but I'm gonna show you guys all of that here shortly. Now we gotta put it up there. So since we have this RTV on the gasket, the gasket's not gonna really move around unless it hits something. So we wanna make sure nothing hits and the RTV is still wet. So even if it does hit a little bit, it is gonna smooth itself out when we torque the whole pan up to the actual engine block. Because what's gonna happen is that RTV is gonna squeeze out and fill in any of those imperfections. And we still have that rubber slash metal gasket in between. So we're just d pretty much double gloving. You can put it like that. We're adding extra protection from leaks in the future. Now, one thing you do wanna be sure is you wanna make sure you clean that mating surface on the engine as clean as you can get it. Use some brake cleaner, but do not spray the brake cleaner directly onto the engine sprayed onto a lint-free towel. I usually use a microfiber and use, you can use brake cleaner or any other solvent that's gonna flash off. Make sure there's no oil residue there and then we're ready to move on to the next step. All right, so I've got all of the small bolts around the whole pan put on. There's only four that I've snugged up, and that means like, I've barely got them tight enough where the oil pan doesn't move around anymore. Now, while I was doing this, I was pushing the oil pan toward the transmission and making sure all of the bolt holes lined up before I snugged them all down. Now, the only bolts that we have left are the super long ones that go towards the very, very back as well as the bolts that go from the transmission into the oil pan. Now, none of these bolts are torqued, but there's thread locker on all of these bolts. So it's only gonna go up to a certain point before it starts resisting. And you don't want to use the impact to tighten them at all, not even to snug it up. So you wanna snug them down with a normal wrench, that way you have a feel for it. And we're not gonna torque any of these until all of the bolts are put in. Then the initial torque is just gonna be six foot pounds, which is barely anything. So let me go ahead and show you guys which big bolts and the length of them, which ones go where. All of the other bolts were the same size, they're smaller ones. Now we have two extremely long ones and three medium long ones. And they're gonna go in the back of the oil pan. The rest of the bolts, you're still gonna have a couple of leftover in the kit because that bolt kit applies to the N54 as well as the N55. So they give you extra bolts for that. So let me show you guys where the two really long bolts go. These are the longest ones. Medium long, super long, super long, medium long, medium long. The two really long ones go in the middle two holes right here. And then we have the three medium long ones, which one goes right here, and the other two go all the way up here. And you should be able to thread all of these in by hand. All right, now I'm just gonna snug them down. Okay, so I've got all of the bolts installed and snugged up. And when I mean snug, I can't emphasize this enough. We just barely want it to touch the oil pan just so that way the oil pan's not moving around anymore. So once you have all of the bolts in, we don't have any of the bolts going from the transmission to the oil pan, we're gonna put those in last. But all of the other aluminum bolts, once you have all of those snugged up, now we're gonna do the initial torque sequence. So on all the small bolts, you're gonna do six foot pounds and then you're gonna to torque all of those to six foot pounds initially. 
and then after that we have to torque it another 90 degrees. The big long bolts, those are also going to be initially torqued to 6 foot-pounds, and then you're going to torque those an additional 180 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the middle, I'm going to go towards the passenger side first, and then we're going to crisscross. So go from the passenger to the driver. Passenger, driver, and just keep going crisscross, and we're going to do that initial torque sequence to 6 foot-pounds. Now when I was snugging up all of the bolts, once I got a good amount on the driver side done, I went ahead and finished all of the passenger side bolts. And the reason I did that is because the passenger side of the engine is tilted towards the passenger side. So what's going to happen is if there's any oil that's still dripping down from the engine itself, if it's going to get into that oil pan, it's going to start trying to make its way out through that gasket towards the passenger side. So we want to try to get those passenger bolts done first, but that's once you have most of them snugged up. It's kind of confusing. If you're quick enough, it doesn't really matter, but I, that's the way I like to do it because I like to take my time. And you want to be very careful with these bolts because you can only torque them once. Once they're torqued, then if you try to loosen it, you have to replace the entire bolt. And they are very, very easy to break. So you want to make sure you're not going crazy with it. So let's go ahead and start with the six foot pound torque, initial torque on all of these bolts and crisscross method. And all the bolts are external torques 12. And this is part of the reason why I removed the entire subframe. This whole process is much easier. Probably should remove the power steering rack too. It'll make it a little bit easier too. So I've got all of the bolts initially torqued to six foot pounds or eight newton meters, whatever you're going to use on your torque wrench. Now that all of that's done, now we can do the final torque. Since we did put that RTV over the whole gasket, you really want to wait about an hour before you fully torque it down. Uh, we're already at that one hour mark, so we can go and do the rest of the torque sequence. Now the remaining torque sequence for all the small bolts that went around the oil pan is going to be another 90 degrees. And then the four super long bolts, or the five super long bolts that are in the back of the pan, those are going to go another 180 degrees. Now when I say 90 degrees, you don't have to be exactly 90. You know, we had that initial torque down. We really want to be somewhere between 60 to 90 degrees. You don't want to go over 90 because then you risk snapping off those aluminum bolts. And if it snaps off, you know it's not going to be a good day. So we just want to get it between 60 to 90. And then for the back ones, we want to get it between say like 150 to 180 degrees. Now if you don't have a torque wrench that could do angle, you can buy separate attachments that just go on a normal wrench or a breaker bar and I'll show you the angle or you could just eyeball it, which I don't really recommend, but just mark it, mark each bolt with a marker and then turn the bolt until you get to that somewhat 90 degrees. So that's what we're gonna do and we're gonna do the same zigzag pattern still. We're gonna start in the middle, work our way out and then once we have all those bolts torqued down with that final angle torque, then we can actually put the bolts in from the transmission into the oil pan. So we've got all of the oil pan bolts angle torqued. Now we can finally put the three E10 bolts from the transmission bell housing into the oil pan. That one. Now we can put the transmission cooler lines back where they belong. I'm going to cut off that zip tie I put. So what you want to do is you can see the bolt right here. The bolt head needs to slide into the section on the oil pan. You can see how it's starting to slide. Now we want to get the front section in as well before we slide it all the way up. And then we're just going to use a 10 millimeter wrench to tighten it up. You just need to get it snug, not too tight. And do the same thing for the back one. Now one thing I did forget to mention when we put this oil pan on, if you did have that return hose on your oil pan, you would have to snap it in place. We didn't, so I forgot to mention it. And another thing that you probably noticed when I put this oil pan back on was the oil level sensor is missing. So I, had, I removed that before I cleaned the oil pan. We're going to be replacing the O-ring on there before we reinstall it, which I'll show you guys all that after we put the whole subframe and everything back together. Now we can start putting the subframe back on. 
So since we had our subframe all the way off, I had to route it back over the steering rack, and then I slid the steering rack back into the tabs that holds the steering rack into the subframe. So all of that's secured, and then we have this pole jack supporting it so we can lift it up. But one thing that we are replacing, and I highly recommend you do as well, are the engine mounts. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put the engine mounts into the subframe and loosely thread in the new bolts that you have to use as well on both sides, get those pushed in, and then we can lift the whole subframe up into the actual grooves that it needs to sit in, as well as guide the engine mounts into the engine mount arms. So we're gonna start with the passenger side here. So there's a dowel that guides the engine mount into the orientation where it needs to be. So make sure it's lined up. And then we're just gonna lightly hand thread these two engine mount bolts in place. And then we'll tighten them once everything else is put back together. So I'll be completely honest with you guys. I really hate all of this gooey, gummy, oily mess. And a lot of you guys are thinking, why don't I just clean everything with like brake cleaner or something like that, just go to town, spray everything off and get all of it off. Here's the thing with brake cleaner. A lot of people might not agree with this, but whenever you start spraying brake cleaner all over the engine and whatnot, there are rubber seals that the brake cleaner does not mesh well with. And those seals will deform and they will start leaking. Now this might not happen every time, but the risk is there and I do not want to deal with that, especially with that rear main seal or anything like that. We don't want to screw any of that up. All of the stuff that's still gummy, I will be degreasing it later once all of the other repairs are done. We'll put the car outside, you know, lift it up a little bit pressure wash, clean everything up as best as we can. But we're not trying to go for a spotless look here. If I did that, I would be here for a whole week just cleaning everything. So for us, now that the subframe is in place, we've got the engine mounts in place. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and thread in the bolts for the power steering rack. Now, you, if you didn't remove your subframe, you probably still have these in there. We're just gonna hand thread them so that way the steering rack's not pushing in and out. It's gonna stay in place. Now, as a refresher, you're gonna have an external Torx bolt with a nut on top. So you wanna slide it in place, and you might have to move the power steering rack around a little bit. Then we're just gonna hand thread it in for right now. And do the same thing for both. With the engine mounts in place, steering rack loosely in place, we're gonna guide the entire subframe to where it needs to go. So as you can see, there's dowels on the frame itself, the frame rails on both sides that need to slide into the, into the subframe. And we also have the engine mounts that need to slide into the engine mount arms. You just wanna make sure those engine mounts are going into the engine mount arms properly. Now we're gonna loosely thread in all of the subframe mounting bolts. You're gonna have one long, one medium, and one small one for each side. The long one goes right in the middle. And you wanna make sure all of these are hand threaded first. The medium size goes all the way in the front. Now once again, depending on your model and year, these bolts might be different. The sizing as far as length should be similar, but the heads might be different. They might be external torques instead of these hex ones. Now we have the small one that goes all the way in the back. If it doesn't hand thread, do not force it. That means it's not lined up and you really don't want to strip these. So now we're going to torque down the subframe bolts. If you have trouble getting those small ones in, you can lightly jack up the back of the subframe or you could jack up the middle closer to that middle bolt, that long bolt. When you jack it up, it should push the back of the subframe up against the chassis, and then you can thread in that short subframe bolt with your fingers. So once you have all of them threaded in with your fingers, bottom them out, then we can finally torque them down. So once we have all that torqued down, then we can also torque down the engine mount bolts. I'll have that down below as well. There are gonna be different torque specs depending on the bolts that you get. Now all we have left is we need to hook up all the suspension back up. So for us, we're gonna be replacing all of these control arms, the tie rods, inner, outer, all of that stuff in the future. So I'm not gonna to fully torque it down, but whenever you're torquing down these control arms or any of these suspension components for that fact, what you really wanna do is you wanna get them installed hand tight, and then you wanna put the wheels on, bring the car down so that way it's on its own weight, whether you put it on blocks or anything like that, 
and then you torque it down when the body weight is already on the suspension. And that pretty much preloads the suspension before you torque it down. But let's just get right to it. Let's start putting all these control arms back in place and I'll show you the bolts that go there and show you all of that. So let's start with this control arm. You're gonna slide it into the subframe. This one slides in from the bottom. Now you wanna line up the hole You don't really want to hit this bolt really hard because if you hit it and it's getting stuck on something, it's going to ruin all the threads. Sometimes what will happen is the clearance is so tight on the other end that you might actually have to screw the bolt in. That way it goes all the way through and then you can put the nut on the other side. Now this is an 18 millimeter nut, 18 millimeter bolt. Now this bolt doesn't have a nut on the other end. There's a bracket that holds a square style nut on the subframe itself. So it's gonna put the bolt in, get it through all the way and thread it in. And this is also an 18 millimeter bolt. Now when we're installing the tie rod end, you usually wanna replace your lock nut because these are one time use only. Now, especially if they have this nylon insert inside, those are definitely one time use. If you don't have one on hand, you can use some blue Loctite for the time being. And you really wanna make sure that these tie rod ends aren't torn like this one is. We're gonna be replacing all of this suspension stuff later on, it's gonna be a separate video. So for right now, we're just gonna put it back together. Now when you're reinstalling this tie rod end into the actual spindle itself, you're gonna to have to counter hold this tie rod end ball joint using whatever size socket that you need. Ours is a T40, so we're gonna hold that and have the nut threading in. So first you wanna insert it into the spindle like this, push it all the way through, then you have your lock nut that goes on top, and it's gonna be different sizes as well depending on the type of tie rod end you have. Now you just counter hold the ball joint with whatever size socket you need for your application and tighten up the nut. And this is how you would tighten it or loosen it. So all the stuff that we did on here with the tie rod and the two control arms, do the same thing on the other side and make sure you don't torque down the control arms until we have everything else put back together, put the wheels on, bring the car down and make sure the weight of the car is on it so it's preloaded before you torque it down. And I'll link another video down in the description that goes over the reason why you need to do that. But now before we reinstall the sway bar, we're gonna go ahead and tighten down the steering rack. First we'll tighten down the brackets that hold the steering pressure hose in place. There are just two 10 millimeter screws on both ends. Now we need to tighten down the E12 bolts that are holding the power steering rack to the subframe. You're gonna to have to counter hold the nut with a 16 millimeter open-ended wrench and just use an E12 socket to tighten it down. And once again, the torque specs will be listed down below. The reason I'm saying that is because I'm not torquing any of that stuff down since all of it's coming back down for the next video. Time for the sway bar. Now, the sway bar is just going to be held in with four 13 millimeter nuts, two on each side. So one difference that you will have on your driver's side is your headlight leveling sensor. So this needs to go before you put the nut on this back control arm, you wanna put it in place, there's a bracket that holds it, and there's a tab on the bracket that guides it where it needs to go, and then you can put the nut on. And depending on how you remove the arm itself, you need to resecure it like that. So if you took it off from the actual level sensor, you're gonna have a 10 millimeter nut on one side, and you're gonna have to hold, counter hold the other end of it. And then also, don't forget to plug it back in. With the sway bar in place, we can put the sway bar link back on. Now once again, this is going to vary from car to car, and if it's been replaced before, for us, we just have this nut, and then we have a standoff on the other end, which we hold with the open-ended wrench. Yours, you might have to put another socket inside to counter hold the ball joint from the sway bar link, and then tighten the nut, same way we did with the tie rod. Now here we have the oil level sensor that was held into the oil pan with three 10 millimeter nuts. So the reason we took this off is to replace this O-ring that's inside. This one actually looks like it's been replaced, 
but since we already have it off, we're gonna go to replace it again. So you just gotta get a pick in there and you just pull it straight out. That's all there is to it. And we can clean it up. Now here's the new O-ring. Does not have a specific orientation. You could put it either way. And you just wanna push it into the groove. Now you can lube it up with some oil or some silicone spray before we reinstall it. Now you wanna go ahead and clean up this whole area, make sure there's no debris anywhere. Now we've got it lubed up. And you just slide it in place. Put the three 10 millimeter nuts all around it. And now when you're tightening these, you wanna tighten them evenly. Tighten them until they bottom out. You don't really need to go extra crazy with the torque or anything like that. There is a torque spec for this, but you'll probably hear a lot of horror stories when people go to torque these nuts down, it breaks the whole stud off. And when it breaks the whole stud off, you're pretty much screwed. You gotta replace the oil pan. And we just did all that work, so it's not worth it. Just get it nice and snug until it bottoms out. And once you have it tight, just plug it in. While we're right here, let's go ahead and change out this oil drain bolt. The ECS tuning oil pan gasket kit comes with a new drain bolt. It also comes with the oil filter and oil. So open up your oil filter box and get a new crush washer as well. So we're almost finished up down here. A couple more things. What we can do is we can actually go ahead and start hand threading the engine mount nut. So this is the nut that goes to the engine mount from on top of the engine mount arm. So it's gonna be a lot easier to start threading it from right here and then tighten it from the top. We also wanna go ahead and torque down the fasteners for the engine mount bolts from the subframe to the engine mount. With all that secured, we still have to put this cover on and then the bracket on underneath and then the rest of the plastic covers. Now for this metal tray, there's three 10 millimeter nuts. One right here, one right here, and one right here. Next up, we have the triangle brace that's held in with six 16 millimeter bolts. Before we release this engine support bar, make sure the subframe and all that stuff is torqued down. Now we can, once we release this, the engine's just gonna go right back onto those mounts and sit on the subframe. You can also take off your tow hook and put it back in the trunk. This will also be a good time to change your oil filter. We left it loose, that way all that oil would have drained out. We need to change the filter, change the O-ring, and we can put this back together. One thing I like to do whenever I have the oil pen removed and the oil draining for hours at a time, so a lot of that oil is gonna go back into that oil pen from that oil filter housing. And whenever I do something like this, I like to pour some oil down that oil filter housing. It's probably not gonna help anything, I just like to do it. Now you know what would really suck? If you forgot to put that drain bolt back in or you didn't tighten it? Yeah, it's coming right out at this point. Next up, we have the 16 millimeter engine mount nuts that we started from underneath, but we're gonna finish it from up here. Next up, we have the three T30s for that hard plastic coolant line that attaches to the subframe. So you wanna start these out by hand. Now these might also be able to be started from the bottom. And the third one goes right here. Sometimes a little extra length goes a long way. Next step is to fill it up with some oil. We're gonna put about six and a half quarts, let it run a little bit. It's probably gonna end up taking all seven because we cleaned that whole oil pan out and we let everything drip out. But six and a half first, then we'll check the level with the computer since we don't have a dipstick and then we'll add whatever else is left. Next up, we have the engine cover. You're gonna have four five millimeter hex screws, two in the back and two in the front. 
And just like that, we finished the oil pan gasket replacement, got the car an oil change, new engine mounts. I did not do the transmission mounts yet, but I do recommend doing them if you're doing all this work. Now, a couple of pointers. If you're doing this at home without a lift, I would definitely recommend removing the power steering rack completely. It's gonna make it a lot easier to get everything off. It's gonna make it a lot easier to torque everything down properly. And when you're doing that, just make sure you have Either if your hoses are leaking, make sure you have new hoses, make sure you have at the very least the crush, crush washers that go on those power steering hoses, as well as some new CHF 11S fluid. So make sure you have all of that. This will also be a good time to replace any of those control arms, your tie rod ends, any of that maintenance that we pretty much removed everything to get to it. Now, everything I've done, all the parts were from ECS tuning. They'll all be linked down below. Any other recommendations I have will be linked down below. There will also be torque specs in the description. And that's pretty much it for this video. Now we still have a few more things that we're gonna film on this car. So make sure you subscribe if you have an E90 and you need that work done as well. I'll have all that stuff also linked on here. We'll make a whole playlist once all of the videos are up. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys in our next video.